people make it seem like when you write your code with AI, that it doesn't make errors. Yeah, that's really, 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 really not the case. So now this file tends to serve as like its brain and its memory so that down the line, it can actually interact with me and the code base a lot better. I recently added an interesting way to talk to the AI in Kesa. I'm talking about this thing like it's a human being side. If I was to read my experience using AI right now, I'll give it a f So today I decided to make a quick video walking you through how I've integrated AI into my workflow as a developer. And um, yeah, there's quite a number of tools and quite a number of things I've <laughs> added to make the process a lot easier because to be honest, building apps with AI, I know everybody makes it sound like it's a dream, but it can be a nightmare. So yeah, in this video, I'll just walk through a couple of tips, a couple of things that I've been doing, or a couple of things that I've implemented in my workflow to make it a lot easier to actually use AI for development. Yeah, a quick disclaimer, I'm by no means saying I am an AI expert or anything like that. I'm just another guy on the internet building apps and using AI to write his code. <laughs> These are all just my personal opinions and things that I've tried that work for me. What I tend to use for coding nowadays is Cursor which is, I guess, the most popular um, code editor for developers right now. Um, and in case I mostly use Claude. Initially, I was using Claude 3.5 and they just brought out Claude 3.7. Um, yeah, what does that mean? Um, it means Claude 3.7 thinks a lot better than 3.5, so it's better. It's like iOS 15 and then iOS system comes out. It's like diminishing returns as they improve because like with the apps I'm building any form of AI assistance is entirely welcome. So yeah, if you make it smarter and smarter, it just makes it yeah more enjoyable, I guess. I'm not doing anything that requires like any wild amount of thinking or wild amount of like calculations and stuff. So I think, yeah, the model matters, but like for what most people will be building, I don't think it's like that big of a deal. But yeah, me personally, I use Claw 3.7 Sonnet right now and um, if you bring a 4.0 right now I'll switch because that's the highest one and <laughs> why not so there are six parts of my workflow that i'll highlight in this video the first is planning when you see these videos online on how people like use ai most of them just say oh i write a prompt i write a prompt for the ai build me a to-do app and then that's it um, I guess for like marketing content, it makes it feel relatable enough that anybody can feel like, yeah, I can use this thing to build an app. But in the real world, at least from the stuff that I've used, I've realized that's not enough. So <laughs> the first step of my workflow mostly for building features or apps is to do a little bit of planning, like actually structuring out, okay, what are the different features that I need to build for a feature or for an app? I have to plan let's see what are the steps that a user is going to take what are the different edge cases that might happen what should the ai do to handle those edge cases things like that i actually have to plan before even starting like prompting because my thing is if i can't explain what i want to do to a human being and get them to do it i really don't expect the ai to be able to do it i legit have to plan out <laughs> the features of the apps before I even give it to the AI so that it reduces the amount of back and forth that we have. Then the next is versioning. You think the next one would be prompting, but the next step is versioning. And when I say versioning, if you use GitHub or even Figma, you know that having different versions of whatever project you work on is very important because at any point in time, you might need to go back. and especially using AI and going deep in a rabbit hole of like letting the AI just edit your code base. I really prioritize creating different versions of my repo to make sure that at any point in time, if the AI messes everything up within a click of a button, like I can go back to like a stable fix. So that's another part of the workflow that is very, very important. It might be overlooked, but it's very, very important. So I'm working on a business management system and part of the features that I'm building at the moment is being able to have 
multiple branches. When I say multiple branches, let's see, um, I own a chain of filling stations and those filling stations have mini marts. So you should be able to sign on to the system and have like an initial headquarter or a main branch, but you should also be able to have different um, sub branches. So to now work on this new feature, like I'd create a different version of, let's say my development environment and then just work off that branch so that if anything happens, I could either just like move back to the development and start again, or I could like move back to a previous commit in the branch. So like it's very school. Like the errors that can happen are very contained. So like if I mess up anything, I'm very certain that like, yeah, I can go back to a stable build at any point in time. The next step is prompting. So there are a bunch of ways that I go about prompting. Um, I recently added an interesting way to talk to the AI in Kesa, but I'll talk about that last. So the first way I go about prompting the AI to get things done for me is by just writing a regular ass prompt. Like if I need to create, let's say a dashboard card to retrieve the number of products in the store, I will literally just tell it. I want you to display a card using this component that pulls information from this table on the database. And then, yeah, just pass that. There are a few things I keep in mind when I'm writing um, prompts like that. First thing, I try to always give context because I realized when you don't give the AI enough context, it might start to hallucinate solutions. It might start to touch different parts of the code that it doesn't need to. And it might start to, yeah, just do things that you don't expect it to. So, a good amount of the time when I'm writing the prompts myself, I try to like use like the at and then specify specific files or I just add them to like the context window for the chat that I'm currently in. Yeah, so that's like one way of prompting, which is like me manually typing and adding all of these. The next way I go about prompting, it was manually prompting the AI initially, but this scenario, I'm actually asking the AI to generate a prompt back to me based on what I tell it. So if I'm, again, trying to build out a feature, let's say that allows companies have like a warehouse, I would tell the AI what I want the warehouse section to allow users do. And then I would ask it to generate a prompt for me to give back to Claude or Kesa itself to actually implement this. So what I've noticed with that is when the AI generates a prompt for itself to work, it goes into a lot more detail than I'd have the time to sit down to type for. So then it ends up creating like a more descriptive prompt for itself and gives itself a lot, um, a, yeah, much better context to be able to actually get the task done correctly. And the more fun one, which I recently found, is actually a plugin or a desktop app that I found that basically allows me to speak and then it converts what I say to text. So that way I can actually have a one way, it's still a two way conversation actually, but somewhat one way, one way speech conversation where I'm the only one talking and the AI response in text. But now I can easily just say, yeah, I want you to build a dashboard that allows users to see all of the orders that they've just made. And then once I let go, it converts it to text. And yeah, I can send that to the AI. The amount of time that that saves is, yeah, it's, it's wild. Because normally I'd have to sit down like for 15 minutes at a certain point, just like writing out typing, fixing typos and all of that. But with the Whisper, I think it's also an AI, but the Whisper, with the Whisper app, I can literally just say whatever it is that, whatever prompt it is that I want, and then it would convert it to text. And then, yeah, the AI builds it. So the next part of my flow is debugging. And again, people make it seem like when you write your code with AI, since it has access to yeah so much training data on like repositories, stack overflow and stuff like that, it doesn't make errors. But yeah, that's really, 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 really not the case. Like I've said, it hallucinates a lot. And 
what does that mean with the recent update sometimes it gives you a response and it names your files differently from what is actually in your file system just because of this giving you a, I, that i don't even know why it does that like to be honest but yeah that's one thing um you could ask it to fix a feature here and then it goes and touches some other code somewhere else and you wouldn't even realize sometimes i mean i've had to start paying more attention to like yeah actually scoping <laughs> where it should touch but like yeah it could just change something in sales when i'm working on like a product feature and sometimes you don't notice until like maybe you go live and then you realize oh this was working this way before how come it isn't now and yeah it turns out the yeah, AI just did this thing i guess yeah that's like why debugging is like a very big part of it and one thing that i'm going to start this is actually part of my workflows but one thing i'm going to start putting time is, into is actually developing tests um i think that's very important because yeah when the ai like starts to do its hallucinations and stuff if there are at least like test cases that already exist then i'll be able to like pinpoint those faster but currently i haven't implemented testing in my workflow so for now i'm <laughs> manually handling the box so for certain things i've realized uh, i don't know if it's because of the training data it has or because of recent updates to the um, framework that i use and which is next.js it doesn't get how certain things work there so let's see um when i'm passing it this this is a little technical but let's see when i'm passing a um parameter in the url in next years you have to await that but for some reason the ai doesn't know that you have to await that so it always writes the code the same way and i always have to keep telling it to fix it one way it's a debug is just telling the ai yo this is an error that i just encountered you can put like terminal code inside you can put like actual error code from like the file inside and tell it the line um, and then ask it to do a fix but then again it just starts to like hallucinate and do whatever it wants and then something that might just need a simple one-line fix it tends to like go overboard and do too much so in that scenario this is why i say even though they make it seem like using ai is so easy you do need some fundamental understanding of how systems and software and coding and programming and stuff work so that you can actually look into the code yourself and fix certain things because even though ai speeds up your workflow there are certain things that if you look into yourself you could just fix within like five seconds as opposed to reprompting the ai for like an hour which is something that has happened yeah so those are like the two ways i'd say i go about debugging looking at it myself or for like larger cases where it's like okay this isn't like a, a five minute thing that's when i like those are the kinds of situation i'm like okay yo can you just fix this and this error a thing that i've started to do a lot more is to prompt it to keep it concise and keep it within the flow that i'm working on so once i started doing that i started realizing that less and less did it do um the issue that i spoke about earlier where if goes to touch something in sales while i'm working on a feature around products yeah that's one thing that i did to like reduce those kinds of error another suggestion i'll make is a good amount of time you have to reprompt the ai on certain things and when you start to identify errors you normally tend to like tell it the same thing to fix the errors so one thing i started doing again is creating notepads with um common queries that I normally or common prompts that I normally send so now instead of me having to like retype all of these things i could just simply add the notepad and um, file and then it just takes that data as like the prompt and then does the fix for the error and i don't have to like type all of that which is a big time saver if you ask me i also use that for like other kinds of prompts like when i'm working on a feature that i need to be reusable i can create like a file a notepad and then tell it that um for this feature i want you to do xyz so that anytime i'm working on a similar feature that needs a level of reusability then i don't need to like type that part of it again i could just add the reusability like notepad file and then it knows okay i'm asking it to make sure that this is the case last but not the least um thing that i'm doing to improve my workflow is kessar rules i experimented with kessar rules and i really like them I, I don't know why more people don't talk about it i think a good number of people who write 
people don't say much about using Kesa rules, but from my experience, it's basically a way for you to train your AI on how you want it to work inside your project or just overall with you. There are different ways people set up their Kesa rules for us. Like It's not like there's a one size fit all. I watched a couple of videos to get to this point. I'd also link those in case you want more context. But basically what I have now in my case rules file is a basic project overview. So something that the AI can always refer to to get a sense of what exactly the entire project is about. It has a breakdown of what the folder structure is. So it can always again refer to know where things are. It has a bunch of rules on how to do certain things like UI implementations, terminal commands, and a bunch of other things. But the section that is most important to me with KSR rules is the lesson learned section. Because one, there's a section where I tell it certain things I always wanted to keep in mind. But nowadays, when I finish up features, I've started to just ask it to update the KSR rules file and add on whatever lessons is learned from that implementation. Again, I don't want to have to be repeating myself constantly, like telling it, you'll fix this and this error, you'll do this and this and this. So then as we go through um, building our different features together, I'm talking about this and like it's a human being side. As we go through building our different features together and we complete them, then I just prompt it, or I use my notepad prompt to tell it, to just update the KSR rules file with the lessons it's learned. So whatever issues we fixed, whatever bugs we resolved, like things like that, it, it will put those inside the lesson learned file if they don't already exist. So now this file tends to serve us like its brain and its memory so that down the line, it can actually interact with me and the code base a lot better. I don't have to be telling it things that I've already told it already because now it actually has a file that I can refer to at any point to see that or oh, this and this and this is how I handled it when it happened then. Yeah, so those are my tips to be honest. Those are the things I've added to my workflow using AI. And so far, I'd say if I was to read my experience using AI right now, I'll give it a four out of five. Um, I'd give it a five out of five, but considering the amount of time I still end up spending debugging at certain times and reprompting the AI to fix certain issues. It takes away the one point, but to be honest, it's like being able to hire a smarter employee to just write all your code for you. And yeah, they do it right. Not on the front end though, but like they do it right. And that's like tremendously valuable. So yeah, if not for like the annoyances and hallucinations that happen from time to time, I'd have said five over five, but for now, I'll just give it a four over five.